You know, the thing is with, with this message that uh, we might find it surprising that we're talking about sex in church. Um, oh, last thing. This is PG-13 today. So um, if you've got kids, Facebook people live, if you've got kids in the room, you might want to put it in headphones or something. Um, or if you've got young people in here and you're thinking, I don't want my kids to hear about this yet because you maybe haven't had the talk with your kids yet um, and you want to wait um, you might want to send them over to the underground or up into the kids' classrooms. Otherwise, we're going to get after it today. So, um, but we hear about sex all the time, right? On the radio, we hear about it on TV. I mean, we, 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 it's on the internet. It is everywhere. It is prevalent. It is all over this, this world of ours. So I find it very appropriate that we do need to talk about godly sex in this house because there is ungodly sex everywhere else. And it's important that we understand biblically what God talks about when he brings up this this idea of sex. I mean, he has a wonderful book in the Bible, Song of Solomon, that talks about this very thing. And so today I want to I want to explore four qualities of God-honoring sex. Are you with me this morning? We're going to have some fun. We're going to laugh a little bit. It's going to get a little uncomfortable for some of you today, but that's okay. I want you to 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 work, work it through, to walk through with with us on this journey this morning. If uh, you are taking notes, you can you can write down all this this fun stuff. I want to just say that we also have it on the U version Bible app, and so you can go there and click on the events, and, and it'll have all the points and all that fun stuff there too, so you can follow along uh, with us as, as well on that. If you're a guest with us this morning, I, Andy didn't mention this. I just want to let you know, if you are a guest with us, we do have some connect, connect cards, connection cards in the backs of the chairs. Uh, please fill those out, and we have some offering buckets in the back. Um, you can leave your offering in there, uh, your ties, as well as those connect uh, papers. Um, also, those papers are really good for drawing on. So um, if you want to take a note or something on those as well, feel free. So I've got qualities of God-honoring sex that I want to share with you this morning. And the first one being this. God-honoring sex starts before the bedroom. It starts before the bedroom. This is something that, that we may not fully grasp or, or you know, maybe, maybe you understand this. I know that, that uh, as... as Often many married couples, will, uh, married couples will talk about, and we also share this in marriage counseling, you know, women are like crockpots, men are like microwaves. And uh, it takes a little bit of time to warm up, to get things going. Now, I understand that because of the guys being like microwaves, guys are ready for sex whenever, wherever. It doesn't matter. Um, and, and it can be at any time. And it's interesting that for guys... Even random sayings and phrases, can, they, they kind of can, can twist them into sexual things. You know, you, you might be cooking a meal, and, and wives, you're, you're saying, honey, could you stir the pot a little bit? And they're like, I'll stir your pot. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or, you know, oh yeah, you know, I, I forgot, could, could you change the oil in the car? I'll change your oil. We say the most random things. We can, it's, it's weird. Our brains can, can sexualize anything, guys. Am I right? But for ladies, it's a little bit more of a, of a longer process. Because, you know, and, and ladies, you can, you can attest this. You're probably going, when they say that, you're going, oh, brother, please. <laughs> Seriously, you just said that right now? Okay. Well, anyway, I want to read to you guys some, some verses from Song of Solomon this morning. And uh, it's in chapter 4, verses 1. We're going to start there. And we're just going to stick in, in chapter 4 today. So you can just keep your finger in there as we go back and forth. But this is what the, the man says when it starts before the bedroom. He says to her, he goes, How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes behind your veil are doves. Notice. He is starting with the eyes. His head is up, not down. He is starting with the eyes, and he is working his way down. He says to her after that, he goes, Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from the hills of Gilead. That might need a little unpacking. 
okay? Bear with us on this today. It's a little bit more of a poem. So as he is wooing his bride, he is sharing these things. And so traditionally, in this time, uh, Jewish women would wear their hair up. And so when he's talking about this, he is saying, your hair is, is down. And it looks really, really good. She might be, you know, flinging her hair around, you know, and, and doing some things like that. But, but it's down. It's not up out of her face, and so it's, it's kind of coming down, it's, 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 it's over. And, and so he is just saying at this moment, he's like, man, your hair looks amazing. And then he goes on. See, he's kind of moving down the face here. He's, he's saying, your teeth are like a flock of sheep just shorn coming up from the washing. You've got great breath. You smell pretty. And he goes on to say, each has its twin. Not one of them is alone. And apparently, teeth would fall out from time to time. But for this, this lady, for, for the Shulamite woman, what Solomon is saying, he goes, you have all your teeth. <laughs> and it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> It's a wonderful thing. Notice, notice with me that he's paying very careful attention to all the details. Long before, long before he's making any kind of move, he is building intimacy with his bride. Long before even the, 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 the stuff gets, before clothes starts coming off, he is preparing for what's to come. He's turning up the heat on the crock pot. Before there's any physical intimacy, what the man is realizing is that there needs to be emotional intimacy. My wife calls this building points. Some might call it investing in your bank account. Okay? Now, I'm kind of a competitive person, and so when, when my wife tells me that, that points have been added to her, to, to, to my, to my, you know, it's being a good time, I get excited. And I don't know if, if, you've, if you've ever discussed this, but, but from time to time, you know, Jill and I, and, and she's not here, so I can say whatever I want today. <laughs> um, pretty excited about that. Um, but uh, no, I, she, she, she knows that I, she's okay with what I say. Um, we build these points, and we've talked about from time to time what places points in my account. And she's like, you know, Mark, when you do the dishes, that really turns me on. <laughs> when you pull that vacuum, that big, heavy vacuum up the stairs, and I hear that thing go on, I like it. I'm going... Really? Okay. See, I think it's when I come out of the shower, I'm like, hello. <laughs> that doesn't work so well. No, it's the, it's the turning on of the water and the dishes are being scrubbed. It's the, it's the vacuum going on. It's getting the kids ready for bed. You see, my wife's love language is acts of service. My wife's love language is quality time. So when I'm able to do these kinds of things for her, she's going, bonjour. <laughs> the crock pot is slowly heating up. And men, we need to remember this. There's more to it than just sliding them next to him on the couch and saying, well, you want to go? <laughs> it might take some flowers. It might take a text of just saying, thinking about you today. Hope you're doing well. Let me tell you this. This is also a really cool and special thing. Pray together. Pray together. That's a way to get intimate with one another, not just emotionally and physically, but now you are getting 
intimate spiritually, when you are able to pray together, this is a big, huge thing. Young people in the room today, hear this. Pray with your spouse. Married people today, hear this. Pray with your spouse. This is important. This is important. And also, think of this too. This is, this is, this is important. Make sure that you're, you're doing the little NST as well. Now, what does NST? It's, it's non-sexual touch. Because, guys, if the only time you ever touch your wife is when you want something, it's not going to go over very well. You need to come and, and just put your hand on their shoulder. Maybe, maybe brush a hair out of their face. Maybe it's just to, to put your hand on her face or, or just to, to do something that, that doesn't lead to uh, a sexual action later, but just to let them know, hey, I'm thinking about you. Hey, I love you. I'm, I'm, that's all. That's all. Maybe it's holding a hand. But non-sexual touch is, is very, very important. So, so he goes on in, in this, this before-the-bedroom type of stuff, and he, he says this, and he's not saying things like, hey there, foxy lady, hot mama type of a thing. He's not going there. He, he continues to honor her, and he continues to bring about this emotional intimacy. He says, your lips are like scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. He's talking about you have rosy cheeks. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built with courses of stone. Now, I know that that would be like a a pretty random and weird comment and compliment. But understand, in this day, too, women were treated like like property. And so very many women had a very low self-esteem of themselves. And so they would kind of hunch over. And they would be insecure. And they wouldn't look people in the eye. And what Solomon is saying is that to to his bride, he goes, you're secure with who you are. You stand tall. And I love that about you. So he's recognizing that there are some different characteristics that this lady is bringing. So God-honoring sex starts before the bedroom. The second thing is that God-honoring sex is passionate In verse 5, he says, Your breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies. Now, I know that we've got a bunch of hunters in here. All right? Both men and women, but I'm going to talk to the men hunters here for a second. All right? How do you approach two fawns? Do you come out going, Or do you actually come with gentleness, approaching those fawns lovingly, tenderly? Think about this for a minute. It's all about your approach. If you do approach like I just demonstrated, the fawns aren't going to be browsing in the lilies for much longer. They're going to be fleeing into the forest. So guys, work on your approach. Work on your approach. Be gentle. Do some things beforehand. But ladies, any approach will work for guys. Anything. Anything. A high five, an eyebrow going up and down. I mean, anything. So just, just as, as there, there are times, be passionate with one another. You know that... that He wants you, ladies, he wants you to want him. And this is a very important thing. I know that for the guys, we're we're told a lot about the crockpot thing. We're told to serve and to to do all of these things. But but on top of that, understand that for the men, we want you to want us. This is important for us guys to know that, that, um, that you do want us around. And that it's not just out of a response of duty, but that there's a genuine desire to want to be together. I want to encourage you together to set up time to be intimate with one another. 
I know that for many of us in, in, our, in our day and age, we can get very busy. And so we tend to lose the passion. You see, Satan's a tricky guy, tricky, you know, in, in the fact that before we get married, he wants us to be sexually intimate with, with one another. And then after we get married, he wants to keep us apart and push us apart. And so often in our day-to-day life as we start raising kids and as we start doing this life together as, as a family and as married couples, we get crazy busy. I mean, some of you, I, I recognize that you've got like four soccer games that you go to on a, on a Saturday, plus you're hitting the garage sales, plus you're, you're, you're trying to get into the mountains to see the colors, and then if you're... It, and then when we start to, to look throughout the week, we've got soccer practices, we've got dance practices, you've got drama things, band things, all these things. It's a bunch of thing things that are going on. Plus, you, you, know, you, you might want to try to fit in some, some workout time. So, so you're going to the gym or you're getting on your mountain bike and you're going for a ride or you're hitting on the, on the road bike or you're taking a hike in the mountains. I mean, you're doing so many things. So at the end of the night, all you have energy for is to watch a TV show and then you're like, I'm done. Good night. And the news is a real turn on, isn't it? Yeah. So it's really easy to just turn off and disconnect. But God created us to have passion with one another, to be passionate with one another. And I want to encourage you, if you have to, because of your busy lives, schedule it, schedule it. Magnificent Mondays. You know, whatever it, whatever it is. Freaky Fridays. I, I don't know. You, you can, you can kind of come up with your own ideas, but that's up to you. If it's a planned thing, then put it on the calendar and take care of it. And this is what, you know, and, and, and have some fun with it and, you know, light some candles or... Do whatever you want to do. Put on Marvin Gaye, you know, let's get it on. Just, just whatever you want to do. Enjoy one another. Listen to what he says here in verse 6. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee, which is all night long, is what he's talking about, until the day comes up, he goes, I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of incense. Now, I don't even know what that means but he's talking about going onto that mountain of myrrh all night long. Hashtag, that is in the Bible. (laughs) Woo! Yeah, all night long. Mm -mm -mm. You see, almost all of ancient texts will talk about sex being an act of procreation. But the beautiful thing, and there are moments in the Bible where it talks about procreation, but here's the deal. Also in the Bible, it talks about enjoying one another intimately through the act of sex. Isn't that a beautiful thing? God created this. God created this, not just for procreation, but for our enjoyment, for our connection to one another. He gave us this this passion He put this in us so that we would enjoy each other. Isn't that awesome? Praise be to God. I love this. So we're talking about, it starts before the bedroom. God-honoring sex is passionate. Hallelujah. And God-honoring sex, number three, is built on absolute trust. In verse seven, he says, you are altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no flaw in you. There's a trust that needs to be built up between a husband and wife. We need to respect one another. We can't be making comments like, wow, looks like you had too many Twinkies today, buddy. We can't be saying things that would cut the other person down. We don't ever want to make a negative comment about our spouse's body. I mean, can, can we be real in here today, I mean, we're having fun, but can we also be real? The fact is, is that when you get married, say, at, at 21, 25, that's probably the best your body is going to look, right? After a while, 
those twin fawns might be twin falls. And um, <laughs> I went there, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but seriously, even the guys, man, you might have that six pack and then it becomes a party ball after a while. <laughs> you age, things happen, life happens. But we need to build that trust and not cut each other down, but lift each other up and encourage each other. This is such a big deal. You know, it it might sound weird, but when it comes to sexual intimacy, um, ladies, just so you understand that many men are, are insecure when it comes to you know, the the loss of their hair or, you know, their love handles or if they are actually making you feel good. And I just want you to to know and encourage you to reassure them that, hey, you're you're all right. I'm with you. I love you. You are my man. And I'm so glad that we can spend this time together. I mean, reassure them. And I also want to say, that at times, I want to just encourage you to not withhold intimacy from one another. Because there's, there, are, there are so many things out there that are not God-honoring sex. But you are truly the only legitimate, the only legitimate way to find sexual fulfillment within your spouse. Let me say that again. You are each other's only legitimate way to find sexual fulfillment. So I want to encourage you to be there for your wife, to be there for your husband. I know that at different times, different spouses may have more desire than the other. But the thing is, when we read in Scripture about what love is between a husband and a wife, what does it say? Submit yourself one to another. It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and laid down his life for her. Serve, serve. Wives, respect your husbands. Honor them, all right? You see, it is not about you in this. It is about the other person. And when you are putting that other person first, you are building and establishing a God-honoring trust that your spouse will never have to worry about where your mind is going when you are building that up in them. God-honoring sex starts long before the bedroom It is passionate and is built on absolute trust. And finally this morning, and I think this is probably, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this because this is a very important aspect to God-honoring sex. God-honoring sex is holy. It's holy. Now what does holy mean? Holy means that it's set apart. It's set apart. And this is what it says in, in in chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. He says, You are a garden locked up, my sister, my bride. You are a spring enclosed. What's he saying here? He goes, You're a virgin. You're a virgin. A sealed fountain. Your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with choice fruits. Now, I recognize that in this day, and through some of the things that we've talked about already, what I'm saying to you, because of where our culture is at, can, can lend itself to think that what I'm saying is kind of archaic and kind of old-fashioned. But what I want to try to express to you and explain to you today is that what God has established as a holy thing is very, very important. Sex between a man and a woman should be considered only between a husband and a wife. All right? Because of these things that happened before, listen to this. This is crazy. What you are establishing as a married couple is a covenant. 
This is why it's holy, all right? It's because what you are establishing is a covenant. Now, what do we know about covenants? Covenants were established in the Old Testament with Abraham and God by what? By a sacrifice, by a shedding of blood, all right? And then in the New Testament, when Jesus established the new covenant, saying that we are to be together, I am building this covenant to establish that you and I will be connected forever. What did Jesus do? Jesus died on a cross, shed blood for you and for me on that cross. And by doing that, he established a new covenant between you and him. And so when two virgin people come together and they have sex for the first time on their wedding night, there is a covenant because there is a shedding of blood that takes place. This is a beautiful thing. And what you are saying in this moment when you are having God-honoring sex, when you are putting this as a priority in your life, you are saying, I want to honor my spouse so much that I'm going to establish the covenant of marriage, the covenant bond with them only. And I'm not going to compromise on that. The covenant talked about in the Bible says that a man would leave his father and mother and unite with his wife and they would be one flesh. We talk about marriage being a, a thing of multiplication. One times one equals one. There is a symbolizing between this union of a husband and wife that makes it to where it is a covenant thing together, the two of them. That is why this is holy. That is why it is separated or it's set apart. The challenge, though, and I understand this, the challenge is that the church has made sex taboo. We don't talk about it. In fact, I remember growing up and hearing about uh, sex only in this way from my grandma. Don't you dare look at a woman. Don't you dare look at a girl. It's just wrong. And sex is bad. Well, after I got married, I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> sex is awesome. Sex is a wonderful thing. And it's a beautiful thing. But for, for so many, we have said forever, no, 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 no. And then you get married, and it's yes, 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 yes. What I think we need to, to rephrase this as is wait. Wait. And then, yes, before you're married, wait, wait. And then after you're married, have a ball. This is why in the beginning or in the beginning of the, of the book, they talk about keeping the little foxes out of the vineyard. Don't let them get in there. Don't let the little foxes distract and steal what the Lord is going to, to work for good in you. Unfortunately, because of our culture these days, we've had many partners and many people have fallen short in this way. And so the, the bond between the husband and wife is, is not as solid as it once was. I want to encourage you, though, with something today. Keep pursuing the Lord. Keep going after him, and in these ways, you will discover an amazing grace. An amazing grace. It says that this, this woman has been loved by this godly man, and I want to just encourage you in this by reading this to you here in verses 15 and 16 it says you are a garden fountain a well of flowing water streaming down from Lebanon and then she says awake north wind and come south wind blow on your garden that its fragrance may spread wherever or everywhere, excuse me. Let my beloved come into his garden and taste its choice fruits. Ooh. 
I like it. Thus saith the Lord. It's in the Bible. I've shared this a few times, and I I talked about that grace just a little bit. Folks, let me just encourage you. You might, in one way or another, you're thinking, okay, Mark, you're talking about this sex thing, and you're talking about this this God-honoring sex. You're talking about this this holy set-apart stuff, but I'm not a virgin, and in fact, um, until today, um, my... My girlfriend and I have, you know, we've been like rabbits. And, you know, I mean, however it has been, or, or maybe there's, there's been some, some time in your past, or, or maybe there was, uh, you know, you didn't even have a choice in the matter. And somebody took away your virginity. And it wasn't consensual. There's lots of things that could um, make you feel shame. But I want to say something to you today. Jesus said, I don't condemn the world. I came to save them. So if you're feeling condemned today, know that that's not of the Lord. All right? It's not of the Lord if you're feeling condemned today. You see, even the adulterous woman that Jesus talked with. You know, the one that, that was brought before Jesus by all of these Pharisees, and they were like, you know, the law says that this, this girl, she's, she's been caught in the act of adultery. She needs to be stoned. She needs to be killed. Jesus said, where? After they all leave, because he says, he who's without sin can cast the first stone, and they all leave. And he says to her, who condemns you? Who's left to condemn you? And she goes, no one, Lord. And he says to her, neither do I. Do you hear this? Jesus says to the adulterous woman, I don't condemn you. The truth is, Jesus loves all of us. He died on that cross and was resurrected for all of us. These things that are established, these things that are set up, it is not a a thou shalt and a thou shalt not kind of mentality. If you think about it from the standpoint of a father with his kids, he is bringing forth these things to you to say, heads up, don't do it because it will hurt you. Your heart will be broken, and I don't want to see your heart break. I want to see joy. I want to see life. This is the heart of a father for his kids. So when these things, when we talk about these things, understand there is not condemnation. There may be conviction from time to time to say, you know, maybe it's time that I start looking at this and start changing some things in my life because I want the best. I want God's best. And you know what? When you walk in his grace and his mercy, guess what you get? His best. His best. Grace for you today. Because when I talk about God honoring sex being holy, we cannot create that holiness, right? It is Christ who makes us holy. So if you feel like if it was lost or stolen, willfully or not, understand the Lord is pouring grace over you right now. And the beautiful thing in that story of the adulterous woman, what does Jesus say at the very end? He doesn't condemn her. But what does he say? Go and sin no more. So I want to encourage you today to walk from this place changed, challenged, transformed, 
We serve an amazing, amazing God who loves us with all of his heart. Each and every one of us in here, he loves us. He loves you. So be encouraged and love one another. Woo each other before the bedroom. Be passionate with one another. Build that trust and encourage each other. And may it be that you encounter the love of one another and may it be something wonderful and holy. Would you stand with me? Well, you did it. You got through the sex talk. Good job. Well done. Can I pray for you right now and just bless you as we, as we finish with some worship and, and, and go from this place? Lord, I thank you for this, this group of people that are in this house today. Help us all, Lord, to honor you with, with our lives. That in every way, may, may we continue to be the body that, that, that you have called us to be. And in our spheres of influence, as you are raising the bar in us, may we continue to live out the love that you have placed in us. May we live it out in our world. May we continue to love all of those people that are around us as you loved us first. Jesus, and continue to allow us to see more and more your grace on top of grace, on top of grace, on top of grace, on top of grace that is in our lives because of you. We praise you and give you all glory and honor. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.